Anyone who has studied family history has run into the issue of conflict in records. This happens constantly and it's a great deal of agony to any of us who are doing this kind of work. So I thought it might be useful to go into this a little bit and give some examples as to how these matters of uncertainty arise and to reflect on what you do about it, how you proceed, and to think a little bit about uh, how it helps us, rather than just getting into shouting matches with cousins about things, let's see how the issue arises and what we need to do to resolve it. So this is a useful exercise. It also includes a little bit of philosophy about how you look at these kinds of problems. I'd like to proceed by giving you a few examples of things that come to mind. Uh, for example, uh, I'd like to show you uh, page five on uh, Edabel West book on the Upchurches, and in this book on page five, she commits some sins. She made some assumptions, and this has been circulated very widely, and a lot of people have become confused by this. But if you'll have a look at this, you'll see that I've made some notes on it that illustrate the problems. For example. Uh, she gives an outline of the Upchurches that she thought started in 1502 with John Upchurch, who, who died on that date, going down through several generations and finally reaching Richard Upchurch, who was her uh, ancestor. And along the way, she talked about Michael Upchurch, who came from England, and his marriage to someone named Francis. So let's look at a couple of errors that she made. And let's not be too hard on Edibel because you and I both made errors, so we need to be tolerant. But first of all, she says that Michael was born about 1620. Well, we later learn he, the more likely date was 1624. Uh, she says he came to Virginia about 1650. Well, more research later on proved that he came about 1638. In a more serious vein, she reported that he married Francis and that she concluded that the last name of this Francis was Delkey. We've since proven that that is not the case at all, but a great many people have accepted her proposal and you'll see widely recorded that Michael Upchurch I married Francis Delkey, which is not true. Now if you go back a little further in history, you see that she was reporting on the father of uh, Michael Upchurch and for that, I simply would refer you to records by Professor Ransom published in the Upchurch Bulletin. If you'll go there and search for uh, Ransom's work on Francis uh, Ingersoll and Richard Upchurch, you'll see that he does conclude that uh, Michael Upchurch's father was indeed Richard Upchurch. And uh, there's more detail there than Bell West had. But then she commits a much more serious error because she goes up Pre to further earlier history and she reports several families who would be ancestors, uh, grandfather, great-grandfather and so on of Michael Upchurch the first. And I simply say that there's no proof for this. Professor Ransom has sought long and hard for this kind of proof and it does not exist. So here's a case where errors appear in print. So it pays you to give a little thought to what you're writing down because at some point There'll be someone telling people, like I'm here telling you about Etta Bell and some of the mistakes she made. We should still give her a great deal of credit for all the good work she did, but this, on this page, she went uh, astray. Uh, let's think a little bit about birth, marriage, and death certificates. The, the problem with birth, marriage, and death certificates is they often are taken as infallible documents. But if you reflect on how these come about, a both the birth, marriage, and death certificates are based on someone giving information. And the validity of that information is dependent entirely on how well the individual giving the information has facts at hand. I'll give you an example in my own case about a birth certificate. 
who, who teaches you how to spell your name? Well, in most cases, it's your mother. And in my case, it was my mother. My uh, full name is Robert Phillip Upchurch, and for some reason she chose to call me by my middle name, and that has always been the case. But she taught me to spell it P-H-I-L-I-P. -I, I grew up as a kid thinking, that's the way you spell my name. But somehow, after I got to the university, it became necessary for me to have a birth certificate, and I acquired my birth certificate, and you know what? My name has got two L's in it. So here was a case where my own mother led me astray, or else there may have been another complication. Perhaps she said two L's when she spoke it, but the person writing it down included uh, two rather than one. So there's a, a case, and now you will find this over and over again. I've seen many marriage certificates and death certificates where the information could be certifiably proven as wrong because the information given by the individual had it wrong in the first place. How about tombstones? We often refer, refer to tombstones uh, for a source of information, and in fact they are a very good source of information because often someone will bother to remember the deceased full name and it will be on the cemetery tombstone and that may be the only place you find it. So let's not discredit tombstones too much, but on the other hand you always have to take it with a grain of salt because they may write that this person is Bunny Upchurch when in fact that's not his name at all, that's what he was called, but that's not his real name. That can lead you astray. How about obituaries? I had one just this week that occurs to me that I'll tell you about. For many years, a gentleman by the name of Ben Lane Upchurch of Georgia was a strong supporter of Upchurch family research. He did a great deal himself, and he um, gave me a great deal of information. And I was sad to learn that he died in December of 2012, just a few months ago. And when I obtained his obituary, I noted that they cited that he had reached the level of being a brigadier general in the U.S. Army, in the reserves, actually. The problem is that I know that Cousin Ben Lane up church became a major general. And uh, so when I looked at the obituary, I had to go back and check my records. And in fact, it was Ben Lane up church himself who sent me the information showing that he was promoted to Major General on 1 October 1976 at the time of his retirement. Now, whoever gave this information for the obituary obviously always thought of him as reaching the level of Brigadier General, and at the very end of his service, he did in fact get promoted to Ben Lane Upchurch. Now, I published a picture of him in the Upchurch Bulletin, and you can go uh, do a search on that and find this glorious article about him. And please bear in mind that my record showing he's a major general is correct as opposed to his obituary. This is just one example about obituaries going wrong. How about census records? Well, again, they're a boon and a bane because the census records are extremely valuable, although you may find the same individual referred to in different census records by different names, sometimes by initials, sometimes by first name, sometimes by last name, sometimes by nickname, but by comparing this individual on the census record across a series of decades, you can come to some conclusion about what the name most likely is. But reflect on how census records are created. In the olden days, for most of the decades when census records were taken, the census taker would come to your house and sit down and he would say, okay, now tell me the names of the children and tell me when they were born. Well, this person citing the names would use whatever name came to mind, and they may even get confused about their own children. After all, if you've got 14 of them, you, you may have a little trouble remembering all of the circumstances. So census records are extremely valuable, but also need to be verified. How about Bibles? They are a favorite source if you can get to them because they often contain information that appears no place else. For example, in a Bible, if, if bother, people bothered to record their families in the Bibles, which they did for many, many years and not, not so much anymore, but you will find in the Bible information that you like that will not find that any place else. For example, there might be the, uh, 
the actual birth date and death date. There may be the full name of the person, and that may be the only place it appears. But again, the person writing in the Bible would be only as good as their own knowledge base. And finally, I'll mention word of mouth. Um, do you believe what someone says or not? Well, I tend to believe them unless I find something to con in conflict with what they're saying. Because often an individual who is telling you about their family will in fact be reflecting on their memory and what they were told over the years. So this may be your only chance for learning what the middle name of Uncle John was. Because they would remember it, but it may not be written down anyplace else, but it exists in verbal fashion passed down through the years. And when the last person dies who knows that middle name, the middle name is gone forever unless someone has written it down. Now, there is, there is a modern technique for uh, dealing with uh, uh, heritage, and that is the DNA process. And a great many people favor this, and it does yield tremendous amounts of information and reveals things never known before. It can be extremely useful. I'll cite one example where I just came across that I would like to see it used, and that is I've had several reasons for thinking about whether or not there were white and Indian marriages in North Carolina in the eastern part of the state while Indians still lived there, say, uh, in the 1800s, the late 1700s and on up into the mid-1800s. And in fact, I have found some evidence that that was the case. This is very scarce information. It's hard to come by. But in those cases where you suspect there could have been a relationship between the whites and the Indians in your background in North Carolina in the late 1700s or early 1800s, a DNA approach might be the one to really advance your knowledge. And we have this in our family and I'd like to see that pursued. On the other hand, you look at life this way. It's generally known that about 10 percent of the people walking around today are not who they think they are. So you have to decide whether or not you want to get into the business and maybe find out at your own peril that you're not who you think you are. In my own case, I have decided that since I've spent so many years working hard on the Upchurch family based on me being an Upchurch, that frankly I have no interest in learning at this stage in life that I'm not an Upchurch. So I'm a little bit shy in going the DNA route. Well, let's recap a little bit about what we do about all of these possibilities and conflicts and so on. First of all, you have to think that these are all valuable resources, but they have to be judged. In other words, uh, trust and verify. You also can reach the point where you have to make a decision. For example, uh, do you keep writing down the six different death dates of someone, or do you seek a different way? And I tend to think of, well, what is the, what is the preponderance of evidence? You, so you make an analysis and you decide, okay, I want to select uh, 1836 as the date and go with it. If people want to learn more, they'll need to look back in the files if they can get to them and find all the different variations. There is also a matter of uh, family preference. I'll give you an example I have run into recently, and that is, uh, back in the early 1800s, there was a man named Stevens that came to North Carolina and settled in the community where I, my people were eventually to live. And he spelled his name S-T-E-V-E-N-S. -E -E well, subsequently, somehow the family began to see the spelling S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. And someone said, well, a lawyer wrote his will and they used the wrong spelling. But I don't believe that. There must be some other reason. At any rate, whatever the reason, we come down to the mid-1950s and we find descendants of this individual in the same family, siblings, some spelling their name with a V and some with a PH. And I had to do some writing about this and I'm afraid I may have offended someone in the family because I even brought up the subject. Because some people in the family probably say, we really all need to go back to spelling it with a V and other people says, forget it, I spell mine with a PH. So, you know, there are family preferences and you need to be sensitive to their perception. Uh, 
I would end with one final thought about family history and accumulating records, and that is that you just need to take responsibility for your own family history. If you're getting information that other people are giving to you freely and they've done their best job of accumulating information, you may find some conflicts, but it's not up to you to blame all those other people. You just need to make a judgment. Now, if you really want to get closer to the fact and you want to hire a professional genealogist, you can go do that and that professional genealogist will probably still have uh, conflicts to report to you, but they may be able to give you a preponderance of evidence uh, report. But in the end, it's up to you as an individual to look at your family history and decide, here's the way I want it portrayed. And if you want to, you can put footnotes in as to other possibilities other than what you have written. I think we just have to look at it as a big game that we play, looking at all the possible resources, picking them out, comparing how they stack up against each other, and finally making a decision which is the right way to go. I hope you'll be encouraged by this rather than discouraged, and I look forward to talking to you more later about other aspects of Upchurch family records.